Mike, Bob Lazari, Tony Angel D'Angelo here in Eastern Connecticut. How are you? Hi, Mike. I am. I, listen, I am better and better. Thanks, guys, for having me on. It's our pleasure, pleasure. Mike. Uh, and uh, let me give our fans out there a little background on Mike. Uh, Tony, he um, played for the Cleveland Indians and Kansas City Royals between 1965 and 1972. Born in Dallas, still lives down in Dallas, just 18 years old when he made his Major League debut against the Red Sox, Tony, back in 1965. Lifetime ERA of 3.56 in 113 games, selected by the Kansas City Royals in the, you remember the expansion draft, right? I saw, yeah. yeah. I, I, I was in Yankee Stadium watching them. And uh, again, uh, it's it's really a pleasure to have you on, Mike. And um, it's uh, we have a ton of questions. You know, you're born in Texas, back in the 1940s. And I have to tell our our viewers that Mike has a birthday at the end of next week. So we're going to wish you Mike. an early happy birthday, Mike. Um, oh well, thank, well, thanks a lot. And of course, you're born back in the 40s. There's no big league clubs down there, Mike. Now we have to know what teams you followed and, and if you had any favorite players growing up down there. Well, back when I was growing up, the Yankees was my favorite club. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, primarily back in the mid 50s uh, when I was just in little league and that sort of thing. But uh, it was uh, always uh, the Yankees for me. I had a good friend of mine. He was always the Dodgers. So we're always out in the backyard playing Dodgers versus the Yankees. And uh, my favorite players, obviously, were Yogi and Mickey and Moose Gowron and all those guys in, from that era. So that that's how I grew up with uh, those guys in mind. Now, we mentioned you were 18 years old in your Major League debut. You must have been one hell of a pitcher in high school, Mike. To uh, to come right from high school and to, you're facing so Boston. Right that quickly. I'm I'm wondering, you know, what do you what do you remember about that day? Here you are, an 18 year old kid facing the Red Sox. Well, back then uh, that was before the uh, you know the expansion. I mean the drafts that they have now. It, yeah. it was uh, kind of every every team would bid on a ball player and whoever got the highest bid or they signed with that that's who uh, owned the rights to him. And if they weren't uh, placed on the major league roster the next year, well, then they were they were up for waivers and could be claimed by another club. And so uh, I was lucky enough to uh, go up with Cleveland in '65, uh, uh, and uh, most of the, most of that was just a, a learning experience more than anything else. I didn't have enough experience really to uh, pitch that much in in the major leagues. But I did a lot of batting practice. I got exposed to a lot of the game. It was uh, very much of a learning process. And um, Bertie Tevitz was the manager back then. And uh, usually in uh, in games, uh, they would uh, get a couple players up in certain situations. And every once in a while, they'd throw my name out there, and I'd be in the bullpen warming up with someone. And, and for the most part, they always went with the other player. Mm -hmm. uh, this particular day was a Saturday game of the week, actually, uh, in uh, Boston. And uh, Cleveland was getting ripped pretty good. I think it was like maybe 14 to 6. Uh, and about the sixth or seventh inning, uh, Floyd Weaver was on the mound and just giving up a two-run homer with one out. And so uh, I was out there warming up, and, and I got the call to come in, and I really didn't even know what to do. I just got the cart, drove up there, and uh, got out on the mound. And uh first guy that I faced was Carl Yastrzemski. Wow. And uh, at that point in time, uh, that really didn't faze me that much. It was more fact that I was in the game. Mm -hmm. And But I got through the inning. I, I, he, he grounded out to uh, uh, the first baseman I covered, made the out there, and that guy popped up, came in, and uh, the inning was over, and that was it. Boy, some memory and <laughs> way, to, way to get your feet wet. And I know Tony wants to know this, too. Mike, uh, you mentioned 1965 Cleveland pitching, Sam McDowell. You're yeah. 18 years old, and you're looking at a guy like Sam McDowell, 325 strikeouts. I want to know how fast this guy was as far as throwing the baseball and how he good was, was he that year. <laughs> well, you know, Sam, is. Uh, I take you what, he had the greatest stuff all around of any pitcher that I ever saw pitch. Uh, he had a, a blazing fastball with a lot of movement on it. He had uh, a curveball, a slider. Uh, he fooled around with a knuckleball. 
Uh, he had a lot of talent in his arm, and uh, it, it was it was just um, a mesmerizing to watch him pitch sometimes because he had all the tools, and uh, he would go out there and strike you out on three fastballs and say, okay, what can I strike you out with this time? You can go to something else. But it was really fun to watch him pitch. It's a reason why they call him Sudden, Sudden. Sam, right? <laughs> uh, absolutely. There's, there's a reason for that. Of course, there was another pretty good player, a pitcher on that uh, team, too, and that was Louis Tiaf, was was there in 65. Yeah. And that was in 68 when you were back with Cleve. That was the year he had a 1.6 ERA, correct, Mike? Yeah. That's that's right. When, uh, he won 20 or plus that year also. So My goodness. I, it was, uh, they had a good good pitching staff, uh, and uh, it was a pretty good little ball club. We, uh, I think in 65, we, we might have finished uh, third or fourth in the league that year. But uh, we had uh, Leon Wagner, Daddy Wags out in left field, and Big Dad Leo in center, Rocky Colavito in right. Uh, How Max could you Dallas beat that? Third base, yeah. Dick Hauser at uh, short. Wow. Uh, good ball club. Uh, no, Larry Brown at short, Dick Hauser at second. They would alternate in there. Uh, Joe Askew and Duke Sims were catching. Fred Whitfield's on first base. So we had a pretty good ball club. Yeah, a lot of fun. Oh, the old municipal stadium, Tony. Yeah. The, uh, the old big municipal stadium. Big place. Again, <laughs> we gotta, we're going to tell our viewers we're on the phone with Mike Hedlund. And as we talk to Mike, we have various pictures of baseball cards on the screen and pictures of Mike uh, as we speak with him. Tony, question. Mike, uh, good evening, and so nice to speak with you. Um, did you um, did you ever face Mickey Mantle in a game? Uh, Tony, no, I didn't. Uh, I think Mickey's last year, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, was somewhere in 64, 65, somewhere in there. But I, it, I, I think it was 65, and I, I never pitched against the uh, Yankees that I can remember. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't in many games in 65. I see. All right. As you can see, as a protected player, I don't think I got in more than about six or eight games, and they were just like one or two hitters at a time. It was just more of an opportunity for me to get a little bit of experience. I understand. And um, I was reading up on you, Mike. You go to Venezuela following the 69 season. Uh, was this your choice, Mike? Was that something uh, the club uh, suggested? How did that all come about? Well, I, I, back then, uh, and, and they still do it, I think uh, when they've got players that uh, they, they feel like need a little bit more seasoning, mm -hmm. uh, they uh, they take an opportunity to, to send them down to winter ball. And so Kansas City, Kansas City sent me down, uh, and I played with LaGuara uh, in Venezuela. And I had a very good year down there. Uh, I sure did. There were some good and some bad that came out of that. Uh, one of the good thing is I, I got a lot of experience pitching. I had a, a season down there. I pitched to like 140 innings down there, and had uh, I had 10 and three on my record, and had an 0.75 earned run average. And I think, but, Mike, you still have the record for the. Uh, for, you, you did not allow an earned run in the first 53 innings you pitched. That's correct. Wow. And and uh, the I think there was like 38 plus innings without a run at all, mm -hmm. uh, let alone an earned run, but. Uh, I, I got sick down there and uh, got something like the bronchial flu or bronchial pneumonia or something. I lost a lot of weight down there, and it affected me for the next year. Sure did. Yeah. It uh, it seemed like the, it came back in 1970 again uh, because of the trip, Tony. Uh, again, it was, it was said that Mike lost at least 30 pounds. It's, you know, a lot of problems during sure. the 70 season. But then 71... You come back and you have your best year. You're 15 and 8, 2.7 ERA, which is fourth in the league, Mike, which is amazing. And uh, again, uh, you're pitching with guys, uh, Tony, a couple ex uh, members of uh, ex, ex guests on the show, uh, mm -hmm. Dick Drago, yes, uh, Jim, uh, Dave, uh, Jim Rooker, correct. He yes, was, right. on the show. was on the show. Yeah, yeah. and uh, my goodness, you had guys like Mo Drabowski, uh, this was back when he, mm -hmm. uh, but but that was a magical season, 71, Mike. You put it all together, fourth in the league in ERA, and, and that's when it was a pitcher's league. Uh, that, you must have been something that, that uh, you're, you're most proud of is that 71 season. Well, it, it certainly is. Uh, 
I, I didn't have a, a, a long career, and uh, but the, the 71 season was the one year that uh, everything came together for me, like you said. Mm. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, I, I always feel blessed that I had the opportunity to even be there. Uh, but it, to have a season like that, uh, it, it's something that uh, brings back a lot of memories. And a lot of that uh, came from the, the type of team that we had. Uh, we had a, a great infield with uh, Freddie Potek and Cookie Rojas uh, up the center and Amos Onis uh, out in the outfield. Uh, so, you know, if I could get it on the ground, uh, we had chances of uh, putting me out or getting a double play, and, and uh, that helped out a lot. There's some of the other teammates of Mike Stoney in Kansas City, Joe Foy, yeah. Lou Pinella, Pat Kelly. These are guys we've talked to and have talked about uh, over the last few years, uh, Mike, and it's just such a, a great thing hearing their names again. Ted Abernathy, Paul Splittorf, Tony, yes. uh, Bruce Dal Canton, uh, John Mayberry, Sr. Yes. He played with, uh, and again, uh, Richie Scheinblum and... Uh, we often talk about this last guy uh, and the, the potential he had. I need to get your opinion on Steve Busby, Mike. I loved because watching Because in Busby. 72, he uh, had just come up. He was 3-1 and one with an ERA of like one and a half. How good could that guy have been if he didn't hurt his arm? Well, you know, if you just take a look at he had a no-hitter in his first two full seasons, and that probably gives you a little bit of an idea of the type of stuff that uh, Steve had. Mm. Uh, Steve came out of California, uh, and I came up at the end of the season in 72, and it was, it was, he, he was very mature for just coming right into the big leagues like that. But uh, I didn't uh, get to see him pitch after the 72 season because I was traded back to Cleveland uh, mm. for 73. But uh, he had the kind of stuff that uh, uh, that was really good control. He had a good curveball and a slider and good uh, movement on his fastball. Uh, plus, you know, he did little things like uh, his his pick -off, famous pickoff move from third to first type uh, situation. So he was a very thinking individual. And, and uh, I think if he hadn't had the, uh, the trouble with his shoulder, uh, there's just no telling uh, yeah. where he would have been. I'm sure he would have been in the Hall of Fame because uh, he just had that kind of credentials mm -hmm. uh, those first few years. I think everybody we've talked to, Tony, and many people we've talked to affiliated with Kansas City have said the same said thing. said the same thing about Steve Busby. Exactly the same thing that Mike did. And uh, what, what, a, what a, I, I just, you know, I, I was a young guy at the time, but I do remember him, and my father said, this guy is going to be one of the all-time greats. And then... Yeah, you know, arm all trouble. it takes is arm trouble. But uh, again, we still have a few more minutes. We're uh, privileged to be on the phone with former Major League pitcher Mike Headland. Tony, question. And Mike, I was looking at your list of managers that you played for. Kind of reads like a who's who: uh, oh, Alvin really? Dark, Lemon, uh, Joe Gordon, Charlie Metro. Who did you like? Maybe who didn't you like? And what did you learn from playing for these gentlemen? Well, I think. Uh... The one that I liked the, the most was probably Bob Lemon. He was uh, a little bit more laid back. Uh, he, he was able to go out there and uh, know how to pat the guys on the back that needed that and kick the guys in the butt that needed that to get the best out of them. And I, I think he did a good job uh, doing that. Of course, uh, being the type of player that he was, uh, mm. you know, he was not only a hitter but a pitcher uh, in his, his career. But uh, he was uh, all around knowledgeable in that respect. So I had a lot of respect for uh, Bob Lemon. Uh, and, and Mel Harder was the pitching coach ah. at that time. So, you know, you had two great guys right there mm -hmm. uh, from an era that uh, their whole Hall of Fame type material. Uh, the person that uh, probably didn't get along with the best was Charlie Metro. Mm -hmm. uh, Charlie had a completely different type of style. He he had us do calisthenics out in the outfield before the game. Uh, you know, just, uh, it just, I don't know where some of the things come up, but he was, uh, it's just things that uh, on a big league level uh, just didn't seem to fly well with uh, the guys that were there in the organization. Uh, but uh, Bertie Tavich was a good manager. Joe Gordon was a good manager. Uh, all of these guys came in with a lot of, uh, you know, experience in their own rights. And, uh, I, Felt blessed to uh, have the experience with all of those guys. Yeah, and of course, Wonderful. the 71 magical season for Mike Tony was under the guise uh, of uh, Bob Lemon. Bob Lemon. Uh, again, 
just to go into a little more statistically, Mike had 30 starts that year, Tony, through 205 innings, gave up only 168 hits, and had seven complete games, uh, which these yeah. days that would make and you a lot of money. Mike, and how do you feel about the whole thing with pitchers today, you know, the starter, the middleman, and the closer? Does, does, that, uh, does that resonate with you? Does that make sense? Well, I'm, I'm from an era when you – I remember Early Wynn was my pitching coach with uh, with Cleveland, and uh, he told me, he said, uh, one time in spring training, he said, we're going to hand you the ball, and we want you to go out there and pitch 300 innings. And and that's that's what they wanted you to do back then. You were to take the, the game as, as far as you could in into the, the ninth inning. Uh, if, if you could get into the seventh, then you got a reliever to come in and, and uh, pick that up. Uh, it wasn't nearly – any kind of uh, hit uh, pitch count at all. Uh, the, the hitters will tell you when you don't need to be there, mm -hmm. uh, not the number of pitches that you throw. And so uh, you go out there and you pitch as, uh, as long uh, as you, you're effective. And uh, when you stop being effective, that's, that's when uh, you turn to, uh, it could be the middleman, it could be the, 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 the reliever, the stopper, or whatever it happens to be. But I, I like the fact uh, of the way that it used to be, because I'm just old school in that sense. You go out there and you pitch, uh, the hitters will tell you when it's time for you to come out and not the number of pitches that you throw. Yeah, it, uh, we've talked to many in that era who said the same thing. Yeah, it was kind uh, of a manly thing. But somehow Mike uh, has said it better than anyone we've ever had. Uh, yeah, so. <laughs> Early win having, having him as a pitching yeah. coach, I guess that would... Teach uh, you a little baseball. <laughs> yeah, that would resonate there and... Uh, I should say, and I wanted to ask you about this, Mike. After that 71 season, uh, you uh, got together with a group of major league ball players, and you went down to Vietnam. Now, uh, is this something? How did you get involved Was with that? Was this a Bob Hope tour? Yeah. Well, it, it's the USO tour. Uh, okay. they, they have a USO tour that's, uh, I don't know if they still do it, but back then, uh, well, I guess they still do. They have athletes from different uh, uh, arena school uh, over to uh, the, the different war zones uh, to Basically, it's a goodwill tour to visit with our soldiers and our service uh, people over there. And uh, I was asked to go, and I thought it would be something that would uh, would be, you know, rewarding for me to go over there and be able to uh, to talk with guys or whatever I could do. And uh, so uh, we went over there in uh, like November of '71, and it uh, the, the the crew that went over there was Bobby Bonds. Uh, Mike Kilkenny, uh, pitcher for the Tigers, mm -hmm. uh, Doc Ellis, pitcher for the uh, Pirates, uh, myself, uh, Jim Enright was a sports writer for the Chicago Times, uh, I think, and uh, National League umpire Nick Colosi. Oh, yeah. And uh, we spent uh, two weeks over there basically just visiting fire support bases and uh, talking with the guys over there in Vietnam. Uh, and, you know, quite frankly, I brought back a whole lot more than I took over there uh, in terms of uh, the feelings that I had, uh, the gratitude for what those guys were doing for us. And uh, it's something that uh, I'm, I'm, to this day uh, brings a lot of emotion uh, to what we saw over there. I can only imagine the emotion you bring back, Tony. Sure. But um, just to go down there, and uh, uh, I'm glad you had that experience. And and uh, it, was, it was some experience. And, again, um, following... Uh, at the 72 winter meetings, Tony, uh, Mike was traded back to Cleveland for Kurt Bavacqua, believe it or not. Yeah. And, uh, again, you uh, didn't make the team out of spring training, uh, but then the following spring you go to the White Sox in the minor leagues. You did very well, uh, respectable 2.9 ERA, Mike, uh, but uh, traded again to Cincinnati after that and never really got back to the majors. Uh, was it major? Uh, was it uh, every guy we've talked to has said their time in the majors was precious. I'm I'm sure you're not a bitter type, but uh, did you think you were done uh, when you pitched had pitched so good with the White Sox? Well, I, the, when I was with the White Sox, they they were really in need of uh, some relief help that year, mm -hmm. and uh, so I I went to Jim Sparks was a manager in, in Des Moines uh, in a Triple A club there, and uh, uh, we we set the role that I would. I would uh, start or relieve whatever they needed on that, but I, I did a lot of relief work in, in that simply for the fact I said, well, maybe I can get back into the big leagues uh, with the White Sox by uh, showing that I can be a reliever as well. 
but uh, the White Sox uh, at that particular time were, were more involved in recruiting and promoting from within uh, their organization of, of their own guys, people that they had signed and brought up through the, uh, the ranks and so forth. So I never really got an opportunity there. And uh, I was traded uh, to the Reds uh, that winter. And the reason that I got traded was that uh, in 74, at, towards the end of the season, uh, Cincinnati had several starting pitchers uh, with some arm problems. Mm. And uh, so what they did is they kind of loaded up with some guys that had some experience in the big leagues in case those arms didn't, uh, you know, produce in spring training and come around. And uh, so as it turned out, uh, you know, what happened to Cincinnati in 75, uh, they mm. all had a good year. <laughs> and uh, so those – those of us that were uh, traded for for that particular purpose became expendable. And uh, at that point in time, uh, I had a couple daughters that were uh, starting to get up into school, and I just felt like that, well, maybe this is the right time to step out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, a fine career it was. Tony, final question. And, uh, Mike, I, I guess when you finally did step out, did you consider – a job in baseball, or uh, did you spend any time in baseball after you'd retired, or it was like, hey, nice career, I'll go do something else? You know, it, it, it's pretty much like nice career, I think I'll go do something else. Mm. Uh, I, I don't know why. I've, I've never been uh, a coach-type uh, individual where I wanted to coach uh, or anything like that. It was like, you know, I've, I've been there, I've done it, I don't have to keep doing it to satisfy anything. And so I'm going to go and see what else I can uh, find to do in this world. And I went to work at a credit union and ended up being uh, in charge of their human resources for 35 years. So oh, wow. uh, I've, I've, I've had two, two blessed careers, and I'm happy with both of them. And I know uh, just from talking and dealing with Mike, he's a great family man. Am I correct in saying that you have a great-grandchild now, Mike? I have uh, five great grandchildren. Five great grandchildren. <laughs> now Mike's not my, an old old man either. <laughs> now I'll be sixty-seven this year, but my my young my oldest one will be uh, seven uh, uh, next week. Wow! And uh, I just saw him yesterday, and uh, he's quite a character. Boy, <laughs> that is that is something. And we hope you have many more years with these guys. Yeah, and, uh, we really do. Uh, well, I, I, I do too, and I appreciate that. And I can't thank you enough, Mike. It's been a pleasure uh, in in the booking process. You've been more than cooperative, and it's been our honor and pleasure to speak with you. And uh, we'll get this interview up on the uh, website soon. And uh, we wish you continued luck, and you become a good friend, and I want you to keep in touch with us and, um, and uh, just give our best to your family, my friend. You're a treasure, Mike, our best. Well, listen, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be on with you guys tonight, and uh, I, I follow. I, I go out to your website and look at your old interviews. I was looking at Rooker's yesterday, so I really appreciate you having me on, and, and uh, thank you very much. It's been our pleasure. Take care. Thank we'll be you, in sir. touch. Bye, Mike. All right. Bye, Bob. Bye, Tony.